long last, it is the day you and I have all been waiting for. I'm going to finish painting my clients, dogs, and cats into this commission. If you've been following my art vlogs, welcome back, but if you're new here, they will all be linked down below. I've been doing a whole series of videos as sort of a behind the scenes look at some of the challenges that can come up in art commissions. This has been a pretty large and complicated piece. It's 30 inches by 40 inches. Not the largest canvas that I've worked on, but it does have an awful lot of details in it. But the stars of this show are definitely the client's two dogs and six cats. Now, I've definitely completed most of those subjects, but I have to go back in and add in just a few parts of some and then one entire cat. If it seems a little weird why I would be painting just portions of an animal today or why I didn't just paint all the dogs and cats at once, my previous videos have definitely broken down my process and explained that. For instance, I had started this tuxedo cat in a previous very early session, but I had to wait for a few more reference photos from the client to make sure that I got all of the markings exactly correct. A black and white tuxedo cat is very distinctive and you immediately look at one and you recognize it but there are definitely varying markings between individual cats. How many paws have how much white on them? Is there any white on the tail? What is the exact shape of the white in the mouth and chest region? I wanted to make sure that I got all of those markings pretty correct to this exact cat. One of the things I love about a wrapped canvas is that you don't have to frame them. You can just let the art speak for itself. I do know that this client plans on framing the painting, but they could change their mind down the road. So I went ahead and I did wrap the entire image around all four edges of the canvas. Because of that, I usually like to find something that isn't super important to the image that I can actually wrap around to the side. It's sort of like a little visual Easter egg that if the client has this painting in the frame for years and years and years, and then they decide to take it out and just hang it without the frame, they'll be like, oh yeah, look at this. And it's just a like, fun little game, I guess, for me to throw in as the artist. some more detailed grass over the cat's legs and tail to add depth to the picture and make the cat feel like it actually belongs here. It's not just sort of pasted on top. This cat is one of the most forward items in the painting that isn't sitting at the foreground table, so adding this little bit of detail really helps add to my atmospheric perspective. Now I'm ready to move on to the final of the six cats in this painting, Charlie. Our first instinct when painting a cat like Charlie is to mix up a bright orange paint because that's what our mind thinks it sees. But if you put a color down that's that saturated, very quickly you will see that Charlie isn't actually that bright and your entire painting is going to start to look very cartoony. So for Charlie's base color layer, I would mixed up a sort of orange tinted tan. And of course Charlie is at the bottom of the painting so I made sure to wrap up my colors around to the bottom edge of the painting. With the base coat down, I moved on to shading and getting in Charlie's exact features, making sure to keep my photo references very handy. I already did a whole video on how I paint textured fur like the stripes on Charlie here, and that is one of the videos linked down below.
I did start to work in some much more saturated oranges at this point, as well as some deep browns into his stripes. And I also wrapped these deeper tones around to the bottom edge of the canvas. around as I painted to make sure that I got a good mixture of the bright saturated oranges that our mind is expecting to see and then the much more realistic and photo correct colors that actually exist in real life. Initially, the hardest part with Charlie was deciding where to place him in the composition. He's the only orange item in the entire composition, so no matter what I did with him, he was going to stand out. So I purposefully placed him in the front of the composition, since he's going to draw attention anyway and that would bring the eye forward in space, but then I overlapped him slightly with the browns of the second dog's chair so that he would blend in with that and even if your eye did get drawn to him, it would move on fairly quickly. Plus, by having the tones of Charlie's fur blending into the tones of the wood grain chair, he will feel like he definitely belongs more and is a cohesive part of the composition. I wanted to make sure that I added enough detail and contrast to Charlie's face so that he would feel like he belonged in the foreground, but not so much that he would stand out and draw too much focus. Eventually I decided that I wasn't happy with the paw on the table and I decided to go back and rework that area. At this point, all that was left was to fill in the two dog paws that are sitting on top of the table and make sure that they made sense with the color palettes of the two individual dogs.
And with that, the painting is finished. I say finished because to me, I consider this sort of a rough draft stage, and I will go more into that in a later video because there is still more information to share about this one painting. So be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to find out how I finish up a composition. I hope you found this useful and inspiring. If you did, please like the video. Have a beautiful day, and I will see you next time.